Hello and welcome to another episode of Gemstone Mine. I'm John, and today we have another lesson from CEDH. CEDH is a metagame within the Commander format that sits at one extreme with highly consistent, highly efficient decks. Not all cards are equally powerful in all formats, or even in all metagames, but there are lessons to be learned from how people are brewing with some of the most powerful cards in Magic's history. And this week is going to be another lesson from CEDH, because CEDH as a metagame focuses on decks which can win quickly and cleanly. In this metagame, setup costs of win conditions must be carefully considered when constructing a deck. Because setup costs are incredibly important to understand when building a deck, as well as understanding the counterplay that new powerful cards allow opponents to find to fight against those plans. Before we get started, I just wanted to say thank you again for joining us this week. If you're enjoying this or any of our other episodes, be sure to give a like, subscribe on YouTube, or a comment on any particular app you use to consume these episodes. It goes a long way to help out, doesn't cost a thing. Without further ado though, let's get started right away, and try to describe what exactly are setup costs. Setup costs are the invisible costs that cards or strategies need in order to be successful. And not just the mana cost or as an additional cost to cast the spells printed on cards, but the actual work you have to do in terms of other cards, mana, or game actions that have to be performed just right to make a card perform properly. A good example of this is something we talked about in our recent episode about the Commander Curve, which you can take a look up at the corner up there. We had talked about Wilhelt the Rot Cleaver, which could be ramped out early on turn 3 by playing a 1 or 2 mana value ramp spell. But, unless you already had a zombie in play, you gain very little by doing so. You're not going to reap those rewards without some Rot to Cleave. The setup cost for Wilhelt is to have zombies already in play for Wilhelt to redeadify. Setup costs are the non-mana resources you need to consider when looking at a particular card or strategy. We also identified that a commander like Lathril Blade of Elves tends to ramp out with mana dorks like Llanowar Elves, and quite frankly, Lathril wanted lots of elves in play. So the same cards that actually helped get Lathril out early also covered part of the setup cost for Lathril's game plan. Wilhelt has a higher setup cost than Lathril, as the cards which Wilhelt's game plan needs to be effective begin to diverge from something which you want to do normally in a game of Commander, mana ramp, card draw, all the good stuff. When evaluating a new card or strategy, ask yourself what other card or cards you'll need to play to make your game plan work. The more cards you'll need to play or to have already drawn, or protected, the higher the setup cost is. Setup costs can include a few different things. Number one, a particular card or cards to combo with. Number two, a broad category of card to synergize with. Or number three, a particular board state or game action to enable a card at all. Why don't we start with number one and talk about particular combos. These are your bog standard combos, your Exquisite Blood plus Sanguine Bond, your Machaeus the Unhallowed plus Triskelion, your Thassa's Oracle plus Demonic Consultation. Why don't we start by analyzing that first one, the classic mono-black win condition. Sanguine Bond by itself is kind of a do-nothing enchantment. You need to have some forms of life gain to actually hurt your opponents with it. But when combined with Sanguine Bond, you generate a loop where anything you do to cause you to gain life or an opponent to lose life causes all of your opponents to be drained to zero life, winning you the game. The setup cost is that you already control Sanguine Bond, a 5 mana enchantment that did nothing specifically useful. Taken the other way, with Exquisite Blood as the setup cost though, it's another 5 mana black enchantment but at least it gives you all damage a form of virtual lifelink which benefits you. The difference between these two is that one is a card with actual utility, although admittedly life gain is sort of a minor benefit. The setup cost to find a specific card to form a combo means you've usually had to invest a tutor or lots of card draw. You have to have found your combo, dug out both pieces, and then spent your mana to play them and this helps us identify one way to weigh setup costs. These costs are lessened when the setup provides additional benefits. Look at a powerhouse like Dockside Extortionist. 
In CDH, not only does it act as an absurdly powerful mana ritual, but it can also form two-card combos with cards like Team or Sabretooth, Emil the Blessed, or Cloudstone Curio. The latter of which technically needs another creature to card to go off, but that's for the details. Dockside being such a powerful card on its own helps offset some of the cost because these combos are really powerful and you kind of want to play Dockside anyway. Being able to get these additional combos is just a nice fringe benefit. Setup costs are offset when those costs are useful to more aspects of your game plan than just enabling the combo you have in mind. Now another form of setup costs are when there is a particular synergy you are hoping to enable. And for this purpose, we're going to loosely define synergy as additional value beyond the basics of what the card's type or text box provide. So Dockside Extortionist has additional synergy in a Cranko deck because it's another Goblin, which increases the number of tokens Cranko will generate for you once you have it in play. The fact that it's a Goblin has greater value for your game plan than all the other goodness that a giant Ritual on Legs will give you. That synergy makes it doubly good for your deck. Remember Wilhelt from our previous episode and like five paragraphs ago? Rather than a specific card type needed to combo off, a broader subtype of cards are synergistic with this particular card. You still need to pay the setup cost to make Wilhelt powerful, as in you need to have zombies in play before you cast him to really get any value. But have zombies in play is a much lower bar to clear than specifically already have exquisite blood in play, as the setup cost to win with Sanguine Bond. The reason this flexibility is an improvement is twofold. Number one, having more potential cards which you could draw into that have synergy with your game plan is much easier, and thus much more likely, than to naturally draw into one of the cards which you combo with. If there are eight cards in your deck that synergize with your commander, that means you're eight times more likely to draw a card that works with your game plan than if you only have one card that synergizes well. Secondly, as we've already identified, a card which has utility outside of the combo means you're not taking a turn off to get things set up. Playing a zombie like Diagraph Captain in Wilhelp may not be as immediately impactful as playing a Rhystic Study, but at its absolute floor, it can still attack and block. It also makes every subsequent zombie you play later in the game, and every zombie you've already played so far, better just by being there. And this helps us identify another way to discern how significant the setup cost for a card may be. What is the threshold to get set up? For example, Wilhelt is probably good to go with just one or two zombies in play. That's two turns of making tokens and drawing cards. Whereas someone like Cranko, you probably want more than a single goblin in play, which is Cranko. Tapping for a single token feels kind of bad. You probably want lots of goblins in play to really feel good about tapping Cranko. Our next type of setup cost for a card is a bit more nebulous, and it's the board state, the current state of the game through game actions taken earlier in that game. This is a good way to categorize the more nebulous decks like Graveyard or Self Mill decks, as well as more generally attacky decks that want a critical mass of creatures on the battlefield. Let's take an example that's continuing to put up results in CDH. Winota, Joiner of Forces. Winota needs a board state where she can get multiple triggers on the turn she enters the battlefield. Just like Wilhelt, having creatures on the board before landing Winota is the key to being successful with the deck. But unlike Wilhelt, you don't specifically need zombies. Really, almost any creature will do, but specifically non-humans will be what she needs to trigger and flip into the powerful humans in the deck. Most creature tokens are good enough, and honestly, even zero drops like Ornithopter and Phyrexian Walker, they're not humans, and they can get you your triggers off of Winota. Another more well-known example may be a graveyard-focused deck like Moldrotha, who just really wants a load of cards in the graveyard to start getting value with lots and lots of casts from the graveyard. In both cases, these decks want to establish a particular board state, but they're even less reliant on particular pieces than a game plan which relies on synergy between cards. And they are far less reliant on specific pieces than a particular combo. So, if combos with a specific card are on one end of a spectrum, and you have on the other side board state where you need something very specific to happen, then synergy given game plans are falling somewhere in the middle of those two. 
Just like the threshold consideration we talked about moments ago, we should consider how hard it is to get into the board state we want. Winona, for example, really just wants to be the aggressor, and that means it needs to be more aggressive than at least one person at the table. They want to be able to swing in, trigger Winota, get a bunch of humans into play, tapped and attacking, and then snowball out of control from there. Which means Winota needs to create a board state where she has advantageous attacks, usually by being faster and more aggressive than others at the table. And, again, it only takes one open person for Winota to really get going. Now, there's some additional considerations to make. Throughout this episode, we've identified other things that may raise or lower our setup costs. The more that you can offset the setup cost, the less concessions you need to make with both deck building and gameplay. Let's review what we've talked about so far. We've identified, number one, the more your setup provides value outside of the combo or synergy you're trying to achieve, the lower the virtual setup cost. Number two, the lower the threshold your setup requires, the easier it is to achieve, and again, the lower the virtual setup cost. Number three, the easier it is to meet the board state criteria for your setup cost, again, the lower the virtual cost will be. Now, there are a few more considerations that we should make here as well. Number four, does your setup cost include any additional turns to work? You should consider this particularly if you're looking to work with permanents that enter the battlefield tapped, or with summoning sickness on a creature with an activated ability that requires a tap, such as the classic Hermit Druid. We should probably also look at permanents which require investment over time, like planeswalkers who need to achieve a certain threshold of loyalty counters before they can be activated for the abilities you're interested in. I also like to think about experience counters with some legendaries like Marin of Clan Nel Toth, which you can probably get up to a reasonable count relatively quickly, but you may need a few turns to ramp up the count to where you really want. The more turns that you have to invest into your game plan, the more difficult the setup cost is. And obviously, the lower the number of turns you need, if you only need to pass around the table once to get back to untap with your creatures who are no longer summoning sick, that's a lot better than needing to wait three or four turns. The next consideration is if there are any restrictions on your deck building that a card demands. We've talked about this before in our episode about tension in deck building. Companions are probably the most obvious example, with Karuga, for example, the Macro Sage, forcing you to start your mana curve at 3, or Luris restricting you from having permanence with a mana value greater than 2. But this could also include things like a Polymorph deck, which restrict the deck builder to running only a single creature or a pair of creatures in the 99. Or CDH decks looking to use Tainted Pact, which restricts that deck to being a true singleton deck, no more than one of each particular card name, including basics. Or even when Noda technically has a restriction there, who wants to have a balance of creatures to attack with, but they have to be non-human, so she can then flip into the cool human creatures with her triggered ability. It could be argued that deck building restrictions are different than setup costs, but I still thought we should at least try to touch on them here. The basic takeaway is still to try to minimize those setup costs as much as is possible. You want to squeeze additional value out of the cards which are part of your setup costs if you can help it. Maximize the benefits you get out of your setup costs even before you can leverage them by favoring cards with more utility. So replace those scathe zombies in your will help deck with something more like Diagraph Captain. Try to minimize your threshold for your game plan in order to achieve its particular setup cost, both by avoiding over-investing into redundant spells and maximizing the time in a game you can spend getting paid off for all the work you did with your setup. Next, know what kind of role or board state your setup cost demands of you. If you're going to need to be aggressive, focused, you need to be aware of which of your opponents are open for you to attack. While on the other hand, if your game plan demands a stocked graveyard, you should be running lots and lots of effects which consistently get cards into your graveyard efficiently. If you're going to need additional turns to complete a setup cost, you may want to look at the clock you're putting yourself on. Haste can be a helpful way to skirt around waiting to activate tap abilities, while proliferating Planeswalker loyalty counters can help you get to the threshold you want faster. Finally, consider deck building restrictions and other tensions in your deck building. What are the costs you're paying before you even shuffle up for your first game with the deck? And that about does it for today. 
if you have a good grasp of these different setup costs, you can pretty quickly hone in on whether or not a strategy you have in mind is going to work or not. Try to identify those cards that feel more dead when you draw them and really only work during your combo turn or really only work if you've got your commander in play. They can wind up being quite painful to see if you're stuck behind a Dranath Magistrate. Have you had any decks that you had to wind up taking apart because the setup costs were just too high? Or did you find any really clever ways to work around your own setup costs? We want to hear about it. You can let us know in the comments on YouTube, where we are Gemstone Mine Podcast. You can add us on Twitter, where we are at Gemstone Mine MTG. Or you can send us an email, gemstonemindpodcast at gmail.com. Until next time, I'm John, and this is Gemstone Mine.